Wait till Helen comes, chapter five. After lunch, Mom sent Heather and me to our room to finish unpacking. I want every box emptied and all your things put where they belong, she insisted as Heather started to whine and protest. If you're having trouble finding places for everything, Mom added, ask Molly to help you. That's what big sisters are for. Without saying another word, Heather began unpacking, stuffing clothes into her bureau and books and toys onto the shelves on her side of the room. Ignoring the mess she was making, I concentrated on arranging my books and papers as neatly as possible. At least my side would look nice. After a while, Heather lay down on her bed and shut her eyes. Thinking she'd gone to sleep, I finished putting my clothes into my bureau and lay down on my bed to read. I was so absorbed in Watership Down that I jumped when Heather suddenly spoke to me. What do you think that child's name is? She was still lying down, gazing up at the ceiling where the leaves of the maple cast ever-shifting patterns. Do you think it could be Heather Elizabeth Hill? Of course not. That's your name. Suppose the initials were M-A-C, Heather whispered. Those are my initials, I frowned at her. Would you be scared? I shrugged. Not especially. Why? Are you scared? She sat up and shook her head. No, I think it's interesting, that's all. She smiled at me. But you would be scared, Molly. I know you'd be. You're afraid right now, and they aren't even your initials. Don't be silly. I opened my book again. If you're finished asking questions, I'd like to get back to my reading. That's a dumb story, Heather said, getting up and staring out the window. I hate rabbits. Who cares what happens to them? Ignoring her, I concentrated hard on Fiverr's desperate attempts to warn the rabbits that danger was coming. This was the second time I'd read the book, and Fiverr was my favorite character. I knew I would enjoy the story more this time, knowing that he was going to be all right. Heather didn't say anything more. When I glanced at her to see what she was doing, she was still standing at the window, gazing out the graveyard, as silently as a marble angel contemplating eternity. As the days passed, the five of us got caught up, caught up in their own routines. In our own routines. From morning until night, Dave worked at the pottery wheel in the carriage house, throwing bowls, plates, mugs, pitchers, and jugs, mixing glazes, and tending his kiln, trying to get ready for a big August craft show. Although he didn't seem to mind our coming in and out, watching him work, he wasn't particularly interested in what we were doing. As long as we turned up for meals and bedtime, he didn't worry about us. Mom was just as bad. She was terribly excited about having a real studio after so many years of setting up her easel on the corner of the kitchen or the bedroom, wherever she could find some unwanted space. She was working on a large painting of a barn. The colors were soft and muted, and all the edges were hazy, as if the morning sun hadn't quite broken through the fog. You could almost smell the damp boards when you looked at it. But Mom didn't like to be watched while she was painting. It ruined her concentration and made her self-conscious, so she'd always tell me to go outside and play. I guess she felt that we were all safe out here in the country. The things she worried about in Baltimore, drug dealers, child molesters, speeding cars, didn't exist in Hollow. The only thing she ever asked me to do was keep an eye on Heather. She thought both Michael and I, being older, should take care of her. Of course, that was the one thing neither of us did. Every morning, as soon as Dave disappeared into the carriage house and Mom went to her loft, Michael grabbed his butterfly net and killed jar and ran to the woods in pursuit of insects to add to his collection. Although I could have gone with him, and sometimes did, I usually took a book in my journal and wandered off somewhere to read or write. And Heather? For a long time I had no idea where she went or how she spent her time. She might start out on the couch next to me, coloring or reading or watching television. Then, without my actually noticing, she'd disappear. She reminded me of a cat I used to own. One minute he'd be curled up next to me, and the next minute he'd be gone without making a sound. One hot afternoon, I went outside looking for something to do. The air was hot and heavy with humidity, and I decided to walk down by the creek, maybe wade or something, just to cool off. Leaving my book on the bank, I splashed through the water without realizing how close I was getting to the graveyard. When I looked up and saw the tombstones above me, I hesitated, thinking I'd turn back in the direction of the cows. Then I heard a voice. Was it Heather's? The breeze swirled the leaves, the creek chattered over stones, birds sang, Insects chirped and buzzed, making it impossible to be sure who was speaking. Uneasily, I climbed the bank and tiptoed down the path beside the graveyard. I found Heather sitting in the shade, staring at the small tombstone under the oak tree. On the grave, she had placed a peanut butter jar filled with black-eyed Susans and Queen Anne's lace. As I watched, scarcely daring to breathe, she said something in a voice too low for me to hear, her hands flashing in the shadows as she gestured nervously. Then she sat back, her mouth half open, her eyes half closed, nodding her head as, as if she were in a trance. 
All around me the leaves rustled and I shivered, sure that the noise they made was hiding words from me that were audible to Heather. Convinced that she was in danger, I leaned toward her, peering through a tangle of honeysuckle, wondering what I should do. "'Oh, Helen,' Heather said suddenly, her voice louder. "'Will you really be my friend? I'll do anything you say. I promise I will, if we'll be my friend.' Again she was silent, her head tilted to one side, a smile twitching the corners of her mouth. The breeze blew again, making a dry sound, a whispering, and Heather nodded. "'I'll wait for you, Helen. When you come, I'll be the best friend you ever had. Cross my heart.' As she leaned forward to rearrange the flowers, I gripped the fence and called to her. "'What are you doing, Heather? Who are you talking to?' She leapt to her feet, her face pale and angry. "'Molly!' she screamed. "'Go away! Go away!' "'Not until you tell me what you're doing.' I shivered as the breeze gusted through the honeysuckle, filling the air with sweetness. Something hung in the space between us. For a moment I felt it watching me. Then it was gone, and all around me the insects struck up a chorus of cheerful summer sounds. "'I don't have to tell you anything.' Heather's narrow face was almost expressionless, mask-like, as if it hid secrets, terrible secrets. "'You were talking to someone. I heard you. You called her Helen.' Without looking at me, Heather took a flower from the jar. Pulling a petal off, she dropped it and watched it flutter down to the grave. You didn't see anybody, or even hear anybody, did you? She glanced at me, her tangled hair almost hiding her eyes. There was something, I insisted. I know there was. Heather shook her head and continued pulling the petals off one by one. She watched them as they drifted with the breeze down to the earth. Don't spy on me any more, Molly, she said softly. I don't like to be spied on. "'You better come out from under that tree,' I yelled. "'You heard what Mr. Simmons said about snakes and poison ivy.' "'I'll stay here as long as I want.' Heather finished stripping the flower of its petals and bent to pick up another one. "'If you want me, you'll have to come here and get me,' she said. A ray of sunlight lanced down through the oak's leaves and touched the jar of flowers, and from somewhere in the branches overhead a crow cawed. Folding my arms tightly across my chest, I backed away from the graveyard. Get bitten by a snake, as I said as I began walking back toward the church. See if I care. The only answer was the rustling of leaves and a faint sound of laughter. Without looking back, I quickened my pace, anxious to get away from Heather and whatever else might be lingering under that tree. You gotta go. Although I tried to tell Mom that I, that I thought that the graveyard was haunted, she was too busy fixing dinner to listen to me. Honestly, Molly, she said, Reading all that poetry is making you morbid. Now get busy and put ice in the glasses so I can pour the tea. But, Mom, if you'd been there, I started to say, but she looked so exasperated I stopped in mid-sentence. What was the use? After dinner, I found Michael out on the front porch watching the stars come out. See that one right there? He pointed at a bright star hanging just above the mountains across the valley. That's a planet, Venus. You can see it in the morning, too. I nodded and sat down beside him, trying to think of a good way to introduce the subject of ghosts. Do you believe in things you can't prove? I asked him. He looked at me as if he were a little puzzled. Like what? Oh, I don't know, ghosts and stuff like that. I hugged my knees against my chest and turned my back to the graveyard. Michael laughed. What's the matter? Are you still scared you'll see something looking in your window at night? Don't laugh, Michael, I I glared at him. I'm not just kidding around. Glancing over my shoulder to make sure Heather wasn't standing behind us eavesdropping, I told him about her strange behavior in the graveyard. So, Michael swatted a mosquito on his arm. You know how she is, always living in some weird little world of her own. She probably has an imaginary friend, and you embarrassed her. You didn't see her, Michael. It wasn't just her imagination. There was something there. I could sense it. I took a deep breath. It scared me, Michael. Oh, Molly, Michael laughed. Next you'll be telling me you actually saw a ghost. I told you not to laugh, I yelled. It's not funny. No, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. Michael and I spun around. Heather was standing just inside the screen door, her face pressing against it. There's nothing funny about Helen, she added softly. Mom should get you on a get you a collar with bells on it, Michael said, like cats wear to warn birds. Then maybe you couldn't sneak up and spy on people. Molly spies on me, Heather hissed. She spied on me and Helen today. See, I turned to Michael. Before he could say anything, Heather looked at us, a frown creasing her face. Molly's right. You better not laugh, Michael. Helen doesn't like either one of you, and when she comes, you'll be sorry for everything you ever did to me. Without waiting for an answer, Heather turned away and disappeared into the shadows in the hall. There, I whispered, clutching Michael's arm. Do you see what I mean? 
Michael pulled away from me. Don't let that little brat scare you with make-believe, Molly. You're acting like a real dope. I am not. Tears stung my eyes and I ran into the house, almost colliding with Mom as she came out of the kitchen. I was just looking for you and Michael, she said cheerfully. Would you like some ice cream? Heather and Dave and I were just about to sit down and try the ice cream maker we got last week. How about it? Behind her, in the lighted kitchen, I could see Dave setting up the machine while Heather watched. He turned to her and said something, and she laughed and gave him a, a strawberry to sample. Now, Dave, Mom said, I saw that. Don't eat them all or we won't have enough for the ice cream. Daddy can have all he wants. Heather stuck out her lip and scowled at Mom. As Dave turned to Heather, I edged past Mom. No thanks, I said. I'm not in the mood for ice cream. But, honey, Mom started reaching out to stop me. I kept on going. She ruins everything, I said to Mom before going in my room and shutting the door. I hoped Heather would stay in the kitchen until I was asleep.